Hey. Okay, here's the problem, guys. This is my favorite passage in the Bible. I know I've lost credibility with you because I say that often, but I think I really mean it this time. John chapter five, John chapter five. I want to invite you guys once again to this Wednesday night. If you are skeptical, you know someone who is skeptical about why do we trust the Bible? It's the fulcrum of everything we believe. Uh, is there biblical, is there reliability to the biblical story? Is there scientific, archeological, prophetic evidence that the Bible should be trusted? Or is it just this take on blind faith idea? So this is the, the conversation we'll have on Wednesday night uh, is one that I teach in, I, I teach master's level like uh, apologetics and theology. And so this Wednesday night, I'll be taking that class, which is a 16 week course, and I'll be smushing it into two one hour segments this week and next week. So come with your hard hats on. We'll have a time of question and answer. So whether it's to strengthen your faith, to give a reasonable answer for someone who asks you, or if you want to invite someone, that is all for this week. Wednesday. I want to make sure you guys know about that. John chapter five. I want to open with a little bit of a, um, uh, a thought experiment. Okay. I want right now for you to imagine that we live in Christmasville. Okay. Some of us would love to live in Christmasville. If you're like me, I love Christmas so much, but I don't want you to think if you like Christmas, don't think about that. Imagine a culture that worshiped Christmas. Imagine a culture where everything they did was all about December 25th and, and, and everything that they thought about and everything that was themed, it wasn't tinsel every once in a while. It was all tinsel all the time. The lights, the trees, the sounds, the music, the fa la 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 las It was all the time. And they loved Christmas so much that they would start to elect these figures that would come in and make sure that you were doing Christmas correctly. You had to have your tree a certain height. You had to have your presents wrapped a certain way. None of the, so I wrap my presents, Christopher Hilkin wraps his presents in aluminum foil, okay? Let me, let me tell you how long it takes me to wrap my presents. No time at all. Put it in the middle, put it upside down under the tree, okay? Whatever. Everyone knows which presents are mine and that's just how I live my life, okay? And it's recyclable. I'm for the environment. Are you? I don't know. Um... Right? So I finish and then I use it to bake cinnamon rolls. So I'm just telling you, there, sure, there's some smudges from the kids' dirty fingers, but it adds to the cinnamon roll texture. Okay. So imagine, if you will, a culture that worships Christmas. And now there's these characters who come in and they make sure everyone is practicing Christmas properly and the, how you give gifts and, and why you give gifts and how you wrap them and, and what time of day you begin. And if anyone's caught opening presents on Christmas Eve, you are gonna be take. How many of y'all are Christmas Eve present openers? Loop. Me too. All right. <laughs> I wouldn't make it in Christmasville. So, right. And you have to have these, uh, and you have to watch Christmas movies, not die hard. You have to watch these movies at this certain period of time. <laughs> uh, right. If you don't watch the Grinch, you're an anathema to the whole culture. Okay. Who would be the central figure of your belief system? Who, who would be the creme de la creme? Who'd be the big boss? Who would be what everyone was obsessed with? Who would be the central figure of your whole culture? A man by the name of Santa Claus. Saint Nick, Papa Gigi. He would be your main guy. And everyone would obsess over him. And people would be careful. They'd start writing stories about him, maybe even some fan fiction. But you had to be in alignment with the proper realization of who Santa was. We would study the history of Santa Clausism. We would talk about the proper way that Santa would see us in modern day culture, right? It would, it would, it would become inappropriate for you to ever consider yourself on par with Santa Claus, right? Some of us, we want to dress up like Santa. That would become completely inappropriate because are you trying to tell us that you're Santa Claus himself? You can't do that. There is only one Santa Claus. And now imagine, if you will, with that depth of obsession over a character and over a culture and over a theme and over a day that a peasant walked into Christmasville, into the town square, and he yelled out, ho, ho, ho. As members of Christmasville, we would go, excuse me? And then as people started gathering, they were going, this guy, <laughs> this guy, 
this guy, you're, you're a peasant. You're nothing. Look at how you're dressed. Look at what you're doing. What's your job? You're, you're a lumberjack? You can't be, look, this guy's, he was ho, ho, hoing. What's this guy ho, ho, hoing for? And while we're all freaking out about this, he starts cutting out a jacket in the color red. And he starts fitting himself with it. And then he grabs some big black boots. He starts putting them on. And while he's doing this, like Tim Allen in the Santa Claus, his beard just starts growing out. He picks up a big sack full of, we don't even know what it's full of, and throws it over his shoulder. The people of the town begin to decry, how dare you put yourself on par with that? And every cultural expression we have, he begins to talk about. He says, you remember the lights? The lights are all about me. Your trees are about me. Your, your present gift, your gift wrapping, all your gifts are garbage. My gift is better. All of your Christmas traditions are terrible. I am the great Christmas tradition. In Christmasville, we would look at someone who would dare talk about our Santa figure and we would say, one of two things. Get out, you ain't Santa. And some people, perhaps the fools, would go, I think this is the real guy. I think this is Santa Claus. And the culture would be split right down the middle. And when we read John chapter five and John chapter six, you might be going, so the Bible. When you read John chapter five and John chapter six, we are at a remarkable disadvantage because none of us live in Christmasville and none of us live in the Old Testament ideology of an ancient Near Eastern Hebraic mind. None of us would catch most of what Jesus is doing everywhere he walks and everything he says. He is uniting himself with their idols. He's uniting himself with the gods of their culture. And then he's tearing down their old way of thinking and replacing himself in its place. And if we don't, when we read the, the story of Jesus feeding the, the multitudes and Jesus walking on water, we're going to miss what he's actually doing. John, in a very real sense, tells a neat story of a guy named Jesus who came and said, be groovy, hang out, give to one another. He had great themes, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A house divided against itself cannot stand, Jesus said, Abraham Lincoln quotes. We like the way that guy thinks. And if you're not careful, you can read the whole book on a surface level of, this was a good guy. He seemed like a great dude. How come we killed him? You ever ask the question? This guy walks around, he casts out demons. He's really nice to people. He says, hang out and be groovy. And then we crucified him? Doesn't make sense to me. If you're willing to jump into the culture of Christmasville and see their obsession and see the idols of their heart and then watch how Jesus interacts with those idols, I think it will become abundantly clear. You see, the people in Jesus' day and age are looking for something. Way back in the Deuteronomical period, Deuteronomy is, uh, two words mean second law. The book of uh, Moses, who is their great central Santa Claus figure up to this point, he gives the people 613 laws. It was their salvation. If you obey these 613 laws, rigid, unchanging laws, then you'll be perfect and you will be, get to go to heaven forever. This is eternal life, 613 laws. And so people began to look at those laws and they would, they would gather themselves around the tenants and then a group of Pharisees came in and they started judging people based on the way that they were keeping the law and their obsession with Moses. And this was, this was their story of their people. They were bound in Egypt, bound in the house of slavery, the book of Exodus tells us. They're confined. The, the, the Bible uses the term Egypt to talk about sin again and again. But God's people, Israel, if, you've, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't read the Bible, the Old Testament, there's this story of God's chosen people. You'd think they always followed God and they always got great things and it was really simple for them. That's not the story. Instead, they were a stiff-necked, stubborn people who constantly turned away from God. And in one of these rebellions, this, this conquering empire called Egypt takes them under and binds them in slavery. And it says, God hears the cries of his people and he sends a deliverer. He sends a savior to them, a man named Moses, who speaks on behalf of God. He takes God's words and speaks to the people. He then, through the power of God, it, it brings 10 plagues on all of Egypt, from flies to gnats to the death of 
uh, cattle to darkness to frogs to the all water in the kingdom turning into blood to demonstrate the power of God. And finally, Pharaoh says, that's it, get out. So he sends the Israelites out of Egypt, but now they come across this body of water. They need to cross to the other side where the promised land is. The problem is they're not swimming, right? They don't really know. No one's like, I'm in good shape to cross this small ocean. What are we going to do? The people start grumbling. You should have left us in Egypt to die. We could have died in captivity. Moses steps out in the water, puts his staff in, and God parts the Red Sea, and they walk across on dry land until they get to a mountain where Moses goes up the mountainside on a mountain called Sinai, which is also called Horeb in the text, and he meets with God face to face. And he is given the law, that which will become to be known as the law of Moses. And he's trying to teach this group of slaves how to be a theocratic nation. Here's what it means to stop being enslaved and to start following Yahweh. I love how one theologian puts it. It took 10 plagues to get the Israelites out of Egypt and 40 years in the desert to get Egypt out of the Israelites. Because they keep, work, like the first thing that happens, Moses goes up the mountain, he comes back down and they are worshiping a golden calf and having orgies right there. God just freed them through his wondrous works and they turn right back to their old idols immediately. So here's this promise in Deuteronomy. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. In fact, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, a prophet, singular. There is an expected prophet coming. Like me, is anyone here named Michael? Okay, good name. Your name is actually a question. Michael means who is like God? What's the answer? Jesus is like God, right? So this is what we're, he is God in the flesh. I'm gonna raise a prophet like me. Can you imagine Yahweh saying, I'm going to bring up a prophet who's just like me? Who are you talking about? Who is like God? That's what the word Michael means. Who is like God? The answer is only God in Abad, Jesus Christ. He is the prophet they're expecting from among you. From among your fellow Israelites, he is born of the house and the lineage of David, the book of Matthew tells us, Isaiah 53 delineates. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb, which is also Mount Sinai. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will, this is Yahweh speaking, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the, keep going, their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my, okay, so here is where Yahweh is saying, this guy's words will be my words. My words are his words. His words are my words. The prophet speaks in my name. Deuteronomy 18. Everything is pointing to the central figure of this prophet that is to come. When Jesus meets with a Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter four, she says, sir, are you the prophet we've been expecting? When John the Baptist first proclaims Jesus' ministry, they ask John the Baptist, John, are you the prophet? He says, no. They say, John, who is this man? Is he the prophet? John's answer is yes. This is the prophet we've been waiting for. This voice of God who will speak on God's behalf. And so the people have been waiting with bated breath through the Exodus story. They have Moses, their great deliverer, but they also expect a better deliverer at some point. But until then, through generations and generations, all they have is this action figure guy named Moses. So this is what the kids play with at recess, little Moses action figures. And they make them do like, this is where he parted the Red Sea. They're obsessed with him. In Christmasville, Santa Claus is king. And in a religious society that loves the law and worships the law, Moses is king. So imagine a man, a 30-year-old with calloused hands from being a carpenter, walking into the middle of town and saying, 
Moses is nothing. In fact, Moses is kind of like, um, let me see if this works. I've never done this before. See this? Where's my hand? Is that my hand? No, that's my shadow. Moses is a shadow. And I am casting the shadow, Jesus says. Moses is nothing. He's an image on a wall. He's a silhouette. I am the great deliverer. He sure delivered you from Egypt. How? Through the power of my hand. I am the better Moses. I'm the better deliverer. I'm the better provider. I'm the better captain of the wilderness. I'm the better freedom from sin. I am the better. I am the better. I am the better. This is why we kill Jesus. Not because he helped people when they were demon possessed. It's because he walks into Christmasville and he says, Moses was bunk compared to me. Elijah, Elihu, he was nothing compared to me. He doesn't really mince words. And without the background of that, the feeding of the 5,000 can just be a neat little tale of Jesus' life. But listen to it through this lens now. We'll do it by first representing, help me out with some mosaic themes. When you think of Moses, help me with some, some big moments in the Exodus story. Again, if you're new to church, you're gonna learn along with a lot of us who are here that are just exploring this thing. But if you're familiar with the Moses story, give me some ideas from the Moses story. What are some big themes, big moments? What are the word pictures that come to your head when you hear the Exodus? Help me out. Good, okay. So we've got the 10 commandments. Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's called cursive-ish, okay? Um, what do you say? You said plagues. What else? Help me out. Keep going. Good. Uh, okay, Red Sea. Good. Keep going. What else? Okay, wilderness. Wilderness. Okay, speaking to God, the burning bush. Good. Speaking to God, manna. What is it? Manna? What is it? <laughs> Manna, which is actually a Hebrew phrase, which is, what is it? Okay, so they literally found mystery meat on the ground and they were like, what is this? And God goes, let's call it that. And they went, manna? And he's like, yeah, let's call it manna. So it's called manna. Manna literally just means, what is it? It's this flaky bread-like substance that was found on the ground that in the wilderness, where there's not a lot of food, God, Moses asks, God, please feed us. And God provides manna. Manna was gross. The people didn't like it. And it, how long was it good for? Days or weeks? Neither. Hours, right? Trick question. <laughs> Hufflepuff, 10 points deducted. Okay. <laughs> Hours. If you tried to keep it overnight, what happened to it? It's spoiled. So Moses is like, I will provide the people with food. They're like, this is gross. It doesn't keep, what is it even? He's like, it's the best I can do. I'm the worser deliverer, okay? Someday someone will give you something better, but in the meantime, this is all I got for you. We've got, what is it? We've got speaking. Uh, how many people are exiting out of Egypt? 10, 20, 30? probably something like 1.5 million people are trying to trek across the desert. You ever try to feed 1.5 million people? Come over to my house. It feeds, feels similar. <laughs> Five kids, you're like, oh man, everyone gets Costco hot dogs all the time. Okay, so we got big crowds that are gathering around. Um, what do we know about the Israelite people? Surely they get freed from slavery. So out in the wilderness, they're carefree. They enjoy it. They, they are very grateful, right? Wrong. What do they do? They like to what? What's the word? They, grumble, 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 grumble. Okay. So we see a grumbling multitude we see the Ten Commandments, the plagues, the Red Sea, the crossing of the Red Sea, the wilderness, manna. These are, this is what John's pulling out. He's gonna start by talking like this in chapter five, verse 41. He says, I do not accept glory from human beings for I know you and I know that you do not love the love, you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my father's name. That was the prophecy of the prophet. I've come in my father's name and you don't accept me. But if I came in my own name, you'd be fine with it. If I'm like, I am Jesus, 
I do great things and I was sent on behalf of Jesus, you'd have no problem. But because I said, I am God in flesh, you reject me. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is, help me out, Moses. On the day that we die and meet God face to face, is Moses going to be there? The Bible, does the Bible say that Moses is going to be there? No. So what do you mean Moses is my accuser? Moses represents the law. So Jesus is saying, look, you guys are, you're, you're already not going to make it. Moses accuses all of you. 613 laws. How many of y'all have kept them perfectly? One of the laws is you are born into iniquity and born into sin. You are a rebel by the, by the very case that you come from mankind. So if you were born man, you've already rebelled against God. James chapter two says, if you stumble in one part of the law, like being born of man, you stumble in every part of the law. Therefore, no one is righteous, Romans 3.10, not even one, for verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So what does this teach us? Jesus is saying, you, you got a bad case. Moses, it's Moses's law. It's the Old Testament system. You're not gonna make it. Your accuser is Moses. If the accuser is Moses, then who is Jesus for us who find our faith in Christ? He is advocate. On one day, you will stand up against 613 laws and you will either come unto judgment and God will measure you and you're not gonna make it. You can't even keep the first law to be born perfectly. And then we've perpetuated it every day. We are liars, we are thieves, we are adulterers, we are murderers. And you might be thinking, I've never murdered anyone. Jesus says, it's the, it's the intent. If you've ever hated a brother in your heart, you're guilty of murder. If you've ever lusted after a woman that wasn't your wife, you're guilty of adultery. This room is full of adulterous, murdering, thieving, conniving, lying, and that's just the people on the stage right now. <laughs> I've said too much. Okay. Your accuser is Moses. Jesus says, and I can be your advocate. Because either you stand up against the law, you're going to fail, or I'll stand up against the law in your place. And I'm going to succeed. And if I succeed and you are in me, then you will succeed up against the law. But without me, Moses, you stand accused. So he's bringing mosaic themes. Remember, until Stephanus in the Middle Ages inserts chapter breaks and chapter markings, verses, this was all one run on thought. If you believe Moses, you would believe me for, think of Christmasville, Santa wrote about me. Moses wrote about me, right? Did you guys know this? This is remarkably nerdy. I'll talk about this on Wednesday more. But starting in the seventh uh, letter of the Old Testament, in the word Bereshit, Bereshit means, well, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Bereshit, it, it sounds like a bad word. It's not a bad word. With the T in Bereshit, which is actually an Old Testament letter, but every 50 letters in the first two books of the Bible spell out the word Torah again and again and again and again and again and again. Fun fact. Torah, 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 Torah. Until you get to the third book of the Bible, Leviticus, where the pattern stops. Then when you go to the next book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it does the same thing backwards. Every 50 letters, it says Torah going this way. So the first two books of the Bible are pointing, are saying the Torah is all about this way. And then these two books point back and say the Torah is all about this. And the middle book is called Leviticus. And if you see the pattern in Leviticus, it spells out again and again, Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. The whole law is about Yahweh. It's not about standing in front of the law and being found righteous. You can go do the, the scholarship right now if you speak Hebrew and figure out this same system. The whole Old Testament is about one thing. This is what Jesus says, Moses wrote about me. Everything he wrote, every letter and stanchion, everything was pointing to Yahweh. And Jesus says, I and Yahweh are one. It's all about me. 
So with these big mosaic themes in mind, we enter in to a very familiar story. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far side of the sea. Oh, we've seen this before. Jesus is starting to elicit these themes, but Jesus crossed over to the far side of the sea. How? In this section right here, in a boat. Does that impress anyone? No, people do that all the time. So they go, you know what? That's not that impressive. Moses walked through the sea to get to the other side. And for you to cross, you needed a boat. Jesus is just setting it up. It's beautiful, right? It's like when you catch someone on video doing something wrong and you ask questions in a way that's coy for them to lie to you. So you can be like, video evidence, that's you, right? Just me, okay. So this is part of my depravity. I love these moments, right? Where you set up the, like you watch, I can watch my kids outside and they don't know I was watching the whole time. And then I walk out and I go, why is she bleeding, right? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you didn't push her off the tree? Well, I'm a little bit, right? I didn't say I was a good parent. I said I tried hard. Okay, here we go. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him. Okay, so now we've got this idea of a crowd following this character of Jesus right after talking about Moses because they saw signs he had performed, right? Why are the people there? They see these wonders. That's what the, the book of Exodus tells us. It says God wanted to demonstrate his wonder to all of the people. Jesus doing the same thing begins to get a following. Then Jesus went up onto a mountain, also called right here, we would think about it in mosaic terms, Sinai. This is where Moses meant to meet with God. He went up to a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish, help me out, what does it say? Passover festival. This is the crux of the Exodus story. Jesus says, take a lamb, slay it, put its blood on the doorpost and the lentil of your house and the angel of death will pass over you. The Passover, here's this, these themes. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for the people to eat? You are the weaker Moses, man. Moses just called down bread from heaven and you need financial support to feed the people. Jesus, it's, he's just tantalizing them. Where are we gonna come up with this kind of money? What are we gonna do? He wants people to say it out loud. If you wanted to feed 5,000 men, including their wives and children, you would need six months worth of finances in order to do that. It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread to each one to even have a bite. And that's not even to feed them. That's like communion for 5,000 people would take six months. That's everyone gets the nibble, right? Jesus said, oh, you're right. Huh? Let's have him sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and started to, to distribute to those who were seated as much as they wanted. When Moses calls down bread from heaven, did he collect all the manna in the morning and then distribute it to the people? No, because who is allowed to provide food for mankind? Only God. In a modern day Jewish dinner table, when you take the bread and you take, off a, you take a roll, you don't pass it to your neighbor because then you're providing them with food. To honor the idea that all food comes from God, you put the bread basket back down and the next person picks it up. In culture, you can go to Israel today and you can walk on someone's property that has a fruit tree. You can grab a fruit off the fruit tree and as long as you don't take it and sell it, you can eat it right there and put the seeds in the ground. This is Sabra law in Israel. Why? Because you didn't grow the fruit. God grows fruit. God distributes it. God is the provider. So even right here, what does Jesus do? He grabs the bread and he begins to give it to them. He's making a significant gesture here in being provider. He's saying, I'm not like Moses. I'm better than Moses. When they had all, oh, sorry, uh, and distributed them who were seated as much as they wanted, he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, 
he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Manna gets gross. It is gross. It is not sufficient. It just tied them over to the next meal. It did not keep overnight. Jesus instead says, I want you to collect all the leftovers because we can have food for a few more days. And in all, how many baskets did, were they able to collect? The same number as there were tribes of Israel in the mosaic idea of them breaking into Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin. There's 12, 12 baskets full. Jesus is going, are you catching it? People of Christmasville, are you catching it? Didn't Santa do something like this one time? But didn't that stuff spoil? Wasn't it kind of gross? Wasn't it a weird name? What is it? What was it? Oh yeah, that's right. It was called, what is it? Do you remember how he was insufficient in these things? Remember how he lost his temper and struck the rock and didn't even get to go in the promised land? Remember how he delivered you temporarily from the slavery in Egypt? I deliver permanently from the sin of death. I deliver better. I provide better. I am better. I'm sufficient. I'm all sufficient. And if you don't switch your worship from the law to the gospel, you're going to be lost. The story doesn't end there. After the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet, Deuteronomy 18, who has come into the world. Jesus knew they were gonna make him a king by force. So he withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And the story continues. When evening came, he went down to the lake where he got into a boat and set off across, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. Grew rough. When they had rowed about three to four miles, they saw Jesus approaching on the boat, walking on the water. What's he doing? He's looking at Moses and everything they remembered him for. And he's going, oh, remember when Moses used to walk through the water on God's command? Daniel chapter 12, verse five through seven. Psalm chapter 104, verse three. The idea of Job chapter nine, verse eight. The Old Testament prophesies, Tan Mashiach HaTavo, when Messiah comes, he will walk on the surface of the deep. Here comes Jesus trotting out on the water in case they had any more hangups about the whole Moses thing. Remember how he walked through the Red Sea? I walk on the Red Sea. Remember how he provided temporarily? I provide eternally. Remember how he saved from Egypt? I saved from sin. I am the better Moses. On a surface level, it's a neat thing to color in Sunday school. Jesus handing out food, it can just look like a, a, a miracle of compassion. But on a deeper level, Jesus is challenging the very idols of their culture, particularly and namely a man named Moses. Here's what I think God does in his mercy. Jesus is better than your God, okay? When we talk about idolatry, here's our natural way that we respond, especially in modern day culture. When we hear the word idol, we think of Baal, Asherah poles, golden calves. And so we, we don't understand idols the way that the Bible understands them. Paul in the New Testament signifies that all sin is idolatry, okay? So when we talk about idolatry, we're talking about sin. What is idolatry? Who is Christ to you? This is the real question. Let me talk about my own life. Idolatry in my life is when I take things that only God is supposed to provide, only things that he is supposed to uh, suffice in my heart, the things that only he can represent and fix and change and inhabit and bring back to life and I start trusting other things to do those instead. The psalmist writes in the Old Testament, the Lord is my strong tower, all who run to it are safe. Christ is supposed to be my safety. So when I, in my thought process, think to myself, God, if you will heal the sickness, right? And I know a lot of you guys know my story of my wife losing her battle with mental health and, and taking her own life. I remember so vividly in those moments just negotiating with God. I need you to fix this situation. You need to come and do this or else. If you want my worship, you're gonna need to change this situation. 
And I thought, if he fixes her, then I'll be safe. I was seeking safety in some notion of if sickness doesn't plague my household, then I'm gonna be safe. And Jesus offers a better safety. He doesn't offer a safety void of trouble and sickness. He offers a strange, unique, supernatural and holy safety in the middle of it. Jesus is a better safety than just no problems. He offers, Philippians says, a peace that passes understanding. Not one void of trouble, but peace in the middle of trouble. He doesn't promise safety from cancer. He promises safety in cancer. He doesn't promise safety without death. He promises safety even in death. Do you understand what Christ did to death? He changed for the Christian the greatest thing this world has to threaten us with and he turned it into a butler. He took death and he said, from now on, when people die, death, you will show them to my chambers. You will usher them into my glory. You don't even need to be afraid of death. Your safety of thinking you're just not gonna get sick is so remarkably inferior to a safety of regardless of what happens in the sickness. You will, Romans 8, 38 and 39 regardless of death or life or angels or demons or things present or things to come or principalities or, or angels or demons or anything else in all of creation cannot separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. A greater safety than cancerlessness is Christfulness. Peace for the Christian is not what we lack in trouble, pain, hardship, and war. It's what we have in the presence of Jesus. Secular peace is a void circumstantial void. I don't have problems. Peace in Christ is presence. It's Christ in me, my hope of glory. So everything that I turn to, to create or to suffice or to placate or to satisfy the things that I want most deeply. And I, I can tell you, there's mornings that I walk up and I stand on the stage and my greatest desire is not that Christ would be made famous it's that you would like me. And so I can teach sometimes to that effect. I can think what will really make them go, man, he's a great communicator. Why? Because oftentimes I want your affirmation more than I want God's affirmation. Why? Because the human heart is an idol factory. We just keep pumping them out. And I can't sit here and go, you guys could figure out your idol problem. And if y'all would figure out y'all's idol problem. No, this is us. This is me. These are the idols of my heart. But Christ says, if I know you and I love you and I am with you, that should be all sufficient. And I go, that's great. But what about these people too? Christ plus nothing is an overwhelming sufficient majority. But my human heart often makes it, God, well, I'm glad you like it, but what if they liked it too? And so sometimes I can put the idea of people liking me in place of who God is. That can be an idol for my heart. I can think, well, God, you are a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. But if my bank account would swell a little bit, then I would be a little bit more comfortable. So I can say, if I have money, then I'll be safe. Then I'll have a strong tower. That's an idol. Why? Because God is my strong tower. Every time I put something in place where he's supposed to provide, I have said, I need something more than Jesus. But Jesus plus nothing is everything. I just forget that. I'm easily deceived. Jesus, in his grace and mercy, does this process then where he destroys idols. Why does he destroy idols? Because imagine someone that you loved who was fixated on the idea that if I get enough money, I'll be safe. Which is why rich people never die. You ever notice that? One of the saddest things in life is when billionaires get sick and you cannot buy another minute of life. we first have to identify what's the idol in my heart. This is a practice that I'm gonna go through this morning and I hope you go through with me. Are, is there an idol in my heart that's taking the place of God? It, here's a way to find out. Do I tie God's goodness to something in my life? You ever notice that Christians, we have this terrible habit of praying by listing really 
uh, beneficial things in our life and then finishing it by saying, God is so good. As if God is so bad if those things aren't the case. Or that if God's goodness, if I don't get these secular idealistic things, if I, if I, my, if I don't get the job, right? You hear this all the time. God, this was our prayer that the cancer would go away. And in a miracle, you took it away. God, you are so good. That's a normal prayer. But what about this one? God, the cancer's back. It's metastasized. It's terminal. And you are so good. It, doesn't it almost sound sarcastic? Because we're so used to saying God is good because my circumstances are good as if it wasn't a character trait of God, but rather a circumstantial trait of my life. God's goodness doesn't change if my circumstances change. But is there something in my heart? Is there something in our heart? Is there something in your life that if tomorrow you woke up and it was gone, you would really struggle with the idea that God could possibly be good? Or you'd withhold worship because of it? Or you'd go follow something new? The reason you want to identify that is because almost every person who has defected from the church did it through this means. Something that they worshiped that wasn't God got taken away. Or, secondly, in a really strange way, some of us, we tend to negotiate the devotion of my life with something. It, this is what Luther did. This is why Luther started the Reformation. He was about to get killed by a lightning storm. And he said, God, if you'll spare me, then I'll become a monk. <laughs> Then that monk was reading Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 in the Old Testament passages about God's grace and forgiveness. And Luther went, Ein Minute bitte, which is German for, hold on a minute. And he starts the Protestant Reformation. But he, he deals with God. He, he does a deal with God. God, if you'll give me, if you'll provide, if you'll fix, if you'll change, if, if, if. If you have a conditional phrase with your worship of God, you do not worship him as God. Whatever your if is, is what your God is. Because if not, then God's not your God, then he was never your God to begin with. After God uses the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're gonna struggle with the idea of the idol of your heart because it's, it's like a fish in water. You don't recognize it. It's just life. But if you're in Christ and you've surrendered to him, when I talk about these things, most of us can bring it up right away. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is bringing that to attention. Secondly, what God does is he exposes that. And he exposes it in two really interesting ways. The first way is this. One of the ways that God gets rid of the idols of our heart is by destroying them to demonstrate their emptiness in our life. Sometimes the way that he does it is in his grace and mercy, not in his vindictive nature, not in his envious zealousy, not in his anger and hatred and pettiness, his loving kindness says, you think you have value because you have money, but that is a house of cards. When the rain comes and the wind blows, if it's not built on Christ, your house is going to blow over. So in his grace and mercy, he calls us to a better rock, a better foundation, a better identity, a better sufficiency, a better worth and a better value. You're not valuable because you're hot. You're not valuable because you're tall or because you're athletic. You're not valuable. All those things are going away. You're valuable because God calls you son and daughter. That is your value. And it can't be taken away. It's both a historical fact for a never changing God. It's not gonna move. Any identity that isn't built on rock is built on sinking sand. He'll tear it down. This is the story of athletes again and again who find their worth in their sport and then they blow a knee and then they get too old and then they phase out and then they're, they, they get a disease and, and it just again and again, they are stuck in this moment of now who am I when who I am was just taken away. Why? Not just for the sake of some sadistic idea of I'm taking away your athleticism. No, it's because that's where you... You think it's gonna save you on that last day and it won't do it. I, I want you to know something better, Jesus says. Secondly, and I think this happens a lot in America. Sorry that it's cut off right here. God tends to, another way of exposing our idols is he gives them to us utterly and completely. You think money is gonna fix the emptiness of your soul? 
Here's a million dollars. Some of us are thinking, that sounds great. (laughs) I wish, right? Some of you are creating idols in your heart for money right now, just so he'll give you a million dollars. Jim Carrey, the great theologian, once said, (laughs) who has struggled his whole life with this concept. Mental health in and out of institutions just can't, because here's his thought. He writes this, I wish everyone for one day could have all the fame, success, and money that they wanted to realize how empty it is. For one day. But some of us will die in the rat race of becoming more famous only to find out that even if we achieved it, it would have been nothing. The, the correlation between people with money and power and persuasion and fame and rates of depression and suicide and self-harm and neurotic behavior and egocentrism and narcissism is so remarkably correlated, you wouldn't believe it. And yet that's all we want. I wanna be famous, I wanna be rich, I wanna be all these things. And yet the statistics show us that we have deceived ourselves in thinking I'm gonna be the exception to the rule. If I get enough money, I will be satisfied. It just didn't work for everyone else in all of human history because they weren't me. (laughs) That's personality bias. That's I am gonna fix what no one else has ever been able to fix. It will be enough for me. Jesus in his loving kindness says, then finish climbing the mountain, summit it. How does it feel? When you finish summing the mountain of fame, you stand at the top, you plant your flag and it feels good for about two minutes until you look across at the mountain across the way. And then you want that. Unless you're willing to look at God's mountain, very different looking mountain, infinitely higher than Everest. But something strange happened on that mountain. The people are at the bottom and God comes down. There's no striving in the love of Christ. There is no, you've got to accomplish this. You've got to work for, there's only surrender because the story of Jesus Christ is not that we climb mountains, that God descends from thrones into dust. After he exposes it, he replaces it with himself. Jesus presents himself as a better solution to our brokenness if you're willing to listen. Most people, after point number two, after it's exposed, they just write God off. He can't be good because I don't experience him as good, so they just walk away. And if you're willing to brave the power of brokenness and return to the king and say, now what? Jesus will replace your old identity with something better and new, himself, eternal, more powerful, more, it's, it's, it's more compelling. It's more interesting. It's more infinite. It's more everything. Jesus is the better whatever God you worship. Then Jesus insists, insists on sitting on the throne of our heart to try to stop it from creating new idols. <laughs> That's all my heart does all day long. I hate it. Jesus sits on the throne of my heart and it's like he's got like a taser and I keep trying to put new idols on the throne and Jesus and the Holy Spirit keep zapping them and trying to keep them away. Stop, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna work. This is the life of a Christian. Until we close our eyes in death, we're saying, Lord, please keep me from the idols of my culture. Don't let me buy the deception that if I have that, I'll be complete for completion is only found in you. And for many of us, we will not know the sufficiency of Christ until we've tasted the emptiness of worldly success. And God wants us to subvert that whole process and to be found in him. He tears down Moses to replace it with himself. And he's willing to tear down your idol to replace it with himself too, if we're willing to be honest about what that is. Would you pray with me? God, thanks for this story that on one hand is a great story about you feeding a bunch of people, but on a much deeper level is about you feeding the emptiness of our souls, replacing the things that we have set up as gods and inserting yourself into the picture in their place. Would you be with us as we face these things and your Holy Spirit brings conviction? And God, if we're not here, we're not following you, would you just begin to to intrigue us to your story and to what all this means for us? In your name we pray, amen.